This is the Steyr AUG A3 M1 that I just picked up. You can tell by this AR15 P mag that this is the NATO stock version that takes AR15 magazines, which I think is just a, a great idea for the American market where everyone has gobs of those things. This particular one is their OD green color, which uh, I believe this is the closest one to the original color that the STG 77 came out in. And they call it OD green, but I mean, here's like actual OD green as we think of it here probably. So in this video, I'm going to go through uh, what I'm going to do to this gun in terms of uh, modifications and putting different parts on it to get it uh, tailored to my liking. I think most people who own guns or are firearms enthusiasts or, you know, certainly people who kind of collect firearms and, and enjoy them uh, pretty much all have like a bucket list of firearms that they see in, you know, movies, TV and in video games and stuff like that. Uh, that they want and this this gun is is at the top of that list for me ever since I first saw it I've wanted one since I was a little kid um, it's just iconic it's classic it's super cool I found it for fourteen hundred dollars on the Palmetto State Armory Labor Day sale recently and that's the cheapest I've seen it by a couple hundred bucks so I decided to jump on it for those of you unfamiliar with the bullpup design, essentially it allows you to have a longer barrel and a shorter overall package due to the uh, barrel being set back into the stock of the weapon and the fire control uh, being forward of the chamber area. So for a comparison here, the AUG is on the left with a 16 inch barrel and on the right is my 10 and a half inch barrel AR and um, I have adjusted the stock on the AR so the length of pull is the same as the Steyr AUG and you can see how much longer even a 10 and a half inch barrel AR is than the Steyr AUG with a 16 inch barrel. And I measured the muzzle devices on these firearms. They're both about the same length. So it's not like there's going to be a big discrepancy between uh, the muzzle device length and where the end of the muzzle of the barrel is. So that's pretty amazing. Um, I haven't really got my hands on many bull pups. And then when I finally got this one and took it out of the box, it really surprised me how compact it was. And clearly you can see, you know, you got a 16 inch barrel in a package that is four inches shorter than a 10, 10 and a half inch AR. In some clips in this video, you're going to see this little Burris uh, 3X prism on there. This was just a placeholder optic um, for me to, you know, shoot the gun and get used to it until I figured out what I wanted on there. Long term, uh, there will be a section later on in this video with my final optic choice and the reasons why I chose that. I've replaced the charging handle, the uh, factory one right here, with this big old ugly thing from Manicore Arms. It's called the Raptor Charging Handle. Um, it's about 15 bucks, and uh, it looks hideous, but it gets your hand very far away from the Picatinny rail, so you're not barking your knuckles on it. It also makes it a lot easier to lock the bolt back up into the catch here. The reason I went with a fixed charging handle and not a folding one like the Manicore Arm switchback charging handle is that this is the NATO stock version. There is no bolt release back here. So the bolt does lock to the rear on an empty mag, but to release the bolt, you have to run the charging handle. And so to do that quickly, I didn't want to have to unfold it and then rack it to uh, charge the weapon after I uh, switched out the magazine. I really like practicing with a sling, so I got to have a sling on this rifle. And with this charging handle and also the factory one, the uh, front QD sling for a right-handed shooter where the sling's going to be coming over this way, not ideal. Also, this rotates freely, uh, which I also don't like. Now, if you were a left-handed shooter and the sling was pulled this way away from the charging handle, that'd probably be acceptable. Also, if you're a left-handed shooter, you wouldn't want to buy the NATO stock version because you can't convert it to left-hand ejection. So, there's a few ways to get around this issue with the front QD point for the sling. What I've done here and has been working good for me is just a Magpul uh, Picatinny QD. It uh, does not freely rotate. It has stops in it, so that's really nice. Um, generally on my ARs, the front sling point I run towards the rear of the handguard or the front of the receiver. So, this is sort of similar to that. It feels really good for me. So, now there's two other options in terms of QD points. Gearhead Works makes a takedown uh, slide right here that has an integrated QD point in it, um, but that's a little bit too far back 
for my liking. And then uh, Kawa Tech uh, makes a QD socket for the pivot point of the front vertical grip, which actually would be a, a decent option. But it's very expensive. It's very hard to get in the States. It's like 60 bucks. Um, now, of course, if I get the factory fixed optic and get rid of this pick rail, then I can't use this anymore. Um, if I had an optic that I needed this rail space right here, I couldn't use this anymore. Um, you can't really put this sling swivel further forward than this position. Um, otherwise, you just run into the same issues of charging handle interference as this sling point right here. Corvus Defense also offers uh, replacement Picatinny top rails that have integrated QD points. Um, they have one on either side, uh, and you can see it puts the point uh, kind of just behind the receiver on the stock there. So the factory provision for running a sling is this loop right here, which is um, on the rear takedown pin. And of course you can insert the rear takedown pin from either side to get this sling loop on the side that you want it. Obviously you can just loop your sling end through this, but then your sling is attached to this pin. Maybe that's the idea that you won't lose the takedown pin if it's attached to your sling out in the field. I don't really know. Uh, for me, I like my slings to come off easily, so an option for that is, uh, you know, an HK style clip or a Magpul Paraclip works just great. Um, what I don't like about this is that the sling swivel rotates and can get all wild and crazy and, and loop your sling up, but this totally works. This is the only option I know of for a rear QD point on these rifles. It's a Corvos Defense um, anti-rotation rear takedown pin and you can put it in from either side. You can put your sling in there in one of two positions. This is the little insert. You can see it's a D shape and it makes it so the pin won't rotate and it just goes right in the trigger pack like that and then the trigger pack goes back in the rifle. All set to go. This rod on the side and this rod on this side are what interface with the back of the bolt carrier group you can see right there um, to actually uh, compress the uh, recoil springs which are uh, captive in the bolt carrier group with the rods attached to it um, for some reason. Maybe it was a video that I saw. I thought the recoil springs were captive within the stock itself, but they're not. They're actually captive within the bolt carrier group. So I'm about to pull that out and I'll show you that. So... Here is the uh, bolt carrier group right here. Obviously, here's your bolt, here's your carrier, um, you know, the cam pin groove, all that sort of stuff. This rod comes forward and interfaces with the charging handle. This rod comes forward and interfaces with the gas piston. Uh, you can see that this and this have hex uh, flats on them for a wrench, so they unscrew from the end of these rods. And then the actual recoil springs themselves are down in these rods. And these two rods uh, right here and here inside the stock are what um, contact them. So like I said, it's just, uh, I like taking stuff apart like this and seeing how it works. And of course I'm doing work on the internals of this thing. And um, for some reason, you know, I was led to believe that the recoil springs were captured in here in the stock, but they're not. They're captured in here, which I think is a, a more elegant and cooler way to um, do that anyways. So while I have this thing apart, um, I thought this was pretty interesting, and I think I've seen a video on this, but it didn't really show it as clearly as I'm hoping to. Uh, how the forward assist works on this is like, here's your charging handle. It's on this little shuttle that slides back and forth in here. It's non-reciprocating. It's got these little clips that lock it into place in the front of its travel. And then um, obviously you pull it back to charge the weapon, release it forward and uh, it stays forward as the bolt reciprocates and it acts on this little ball end right here to uh, pull the bolt rear rearward and release it. So uh, this charging handle also does this right here. It's uh, spring loaded and it goes up towards the top of the receiver. And you can see right here, as you do that, it's compressing a little plunger on a spring. And so what that's doing, if we can see it here in this barrel, it's going to be a little tricky, 
But as you do that, you can see that little plunger coming into the barrel of the charging handle uh, carriage, right? So what that little plunger interacts with is this groove on the operating rod that is attached to the bolt carrier group. So you uh, push the charging handle up towards the top of the receiver and it will um, engage that pin with this little shoulder and then you can you know, use it as a forward assist device to pull the bolt carrier group forward into battery. Anyways, stripping this thing all the way down so I can get the uh, safety out of there, right? So it sits like this in the gun forward barrel. And uh, this thing is just sharp as shit. So it uh, really works good to just take a file and kind of knock down those corners so you're not freaking gouging your fingers every time you uh, actuate the safety on or off. So another thing about the NATO stock version, which this is, so that little pin right there, that's the trigger actuation rod. On the factory or the you know traditional stock version, there's one on either side. But since this has the magazine uh, catch linkage right in here for the Stanag style magazines, the op rod for the trigger only hits one side of the trigger pack. And of course, that interface is um, right there on the uh, normal trigger packs. It would interface on both sides, and also the NATO trigger packs are different than the standard trigger packs. So yeah, there's that single-sided operating rod. The, uh, the traditional AUG stocks that take their proprietary mags have another leg that comes out. Um, so due to the flex and movement of this and also the fact that it's only engaging on one side that or versus you know both sides on the trigger pack i would venture a guess that the nato stock versions even have a worse trigger pull than the traditional stock uh, versions it's no secret that bullpup triggers kind of suck there's linkage from here all the way back to here to get them to actuate this is not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be based on how people talk about it. So um, there's a little bit of play in the trigger, forward and backwards, but that's fine. And that can be adjusted out of there. That's how the interface of the trigger to the um, actuation rod, uh, that can be adjusted. But um, it's just heavy, gritty, 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 and then a... Uh, break with some mush and over travel the reset is long gritty stagey so it's not terrible but it's totally usable this is right out of the box i pulled the trigger pack there's no lube on it you're not supposed to lube the trigger packs it's all polymer so let's see what this trigger weight is if my freaking gauge will even pick it up nope Maxed out my trigger gauge, so uh, I'm guessing it's around 10 pounds. Um, in the literature of this, they say the only thing you do for maintenance is take the trigger pack out, wipe it down with um, water and a rag, and then dry it off. You don't lube these. Um, and But I have also seen, I think it was a video from the Australian Army about uh, putting some dry graphite on there to lubricate it. So I'm going to try that and see if it lightens it up or smooths it out at all. And then I'll show you the other upgrades that I'm going to be doing for this trigger. Completely dry, no lube on at all. That's how it should be, but I have an idea that uh, dry powdered graphite lubricant might help here. So I'm gonna... Um, do a little powder there, a little powder on these guys. This is a coarser powder than I thought it would be. But let me go ahead and kind of squirt some down there, squirt some down there, kind of get some more in here. 
So the only thing I did was put some dry graphite lubricant on the trigger pack. You saw me do that. Uh, and it actually smoothed it up really nicely. So, um, a lot less gritty and stagey. And the reset is a lot, uh, a lot smoother and a lot more positive. So that's pretty nice. I don't think we've, uh, affected the weight of it at all, but we'll double check here. Oh, well, I'll be damned. It's actually on the scale now, and it's about eight pounds, where before this max is out at nine, so it was probably, well, it was above nine. That's what I can say, and now it's on the scale. Now it's at, uh, now it's at about eight and a quarter pounds. So um, it looks like just throwing some dry graphite lubricant on there is maybe not a bad thing for these trigger packs. Of course, you don't want to get the dry graphite lubricant that comes in the aerosol cans and then dries out after you apply it because that may have some sort of uh, byproduct in it that could negatively affect the plastic of the trigger group. Well, the graphite lubricant was an interesting uh, experiment. That's kind of cool. Uh, and I think I'll probably be running that for the foreseeable future if I need to uh, freshen this thing up, but really the next uh, big thing here is the 2020 precision uh, slash Ratworks um, precision sear that's going to go in this thing, and we'll see what that does to the trigger pull uh, in terms of action and weight. So they give you a little template, and I'm just going to mark it uh, with a fine tip sharpie, and then I will get in there with a Dremel and do what I need to do. So before I get to cutting, the whole reason that this back area right here would need to be relieved is um, that is the over travel stop of the sear, right? So the trigger directly pushes on the sear, pushes it back and allows it to release the hammer. I can see right now that I can get this sear far back enough to clear my hammer. So I'm actually going to reassemble it, put it in the gun and check it before I start hogging on anything in here. So, didn't modify the trigger pack at all, putting it back in, checking the trigger. It clearly works. Uh, the um, travel before the break, uh, the over travel, and the reset distance are all greatly reduced. Um, I'm glad I didn't start hogging on it based on this little card. All right, better lighting. Here we go. So here's the Ratworks sear installed in the trigger pack. This right here is the little nub they want you to trim, and they want you to trim this vertical face back this way because that is actually the over-travel stop for the sear. But as you can see here, I can pull the sear far enough back to release the hammer. So... Rather than listening to their little um, card right here that would have told me to, you know, hack almost an eighth of an inch off that, uh, I can now actually, um, you know, fit this sear to my individual trigger pack by seeing, okay, there, I actually have enough clearance for the sear to release the hammer. And now just to give myself a little bit extra to make sure it functions reliably, I'm going to take very, very little material off the front face of this over travel stop, not three thirty seconds to an eighth of an inch like this was saying that I needed to. So this first mark right here to the right is where I had marked it with their little piece of paper. This is actually where I'm going to uh, cut it back to, to just give me a little bit more margin on that rearward travel, but keep that over travel. Uh, as minimal as possible and therefore also keeping my reset as minimal as possible. Okay, so I got the Ratwork Sear fit into the trigger pack. I got the uh, little nubbin uh, ground down to get the amount of over travel that I want that I believe will give me reliable operation of this in a variety of uh, conditions. So here's now what it looks like. So, the pre-travel distance before it breaks and the over-travel are greatly reduced. Obviously, reducing over-travel reduces your reset distance. Now the question is, is that did that affect the trigger weight at all, being now that the sear um, hammer interface is metal and plastic rather than plastic and plastic? So, let's go ahead and answer that question. 
question. Nope, so if you recall, uh, after adding the dry graphite to the trigger pack, the um, trigger pull weight was about eight and a quarter pounds, just like it is now. So what does the Ratworks uh, 2020 Precision Sear do? It reduces pre-travel and over-travel, and therefore your uh, trigger reset distance as well, but it does not affect the weight of the trigger To reduce the weight of the trigger pull, I got the um, Steyr factory upgraded trigger spring kit. I had to wait for a couple of months for this to be in stock on the Steyr USA website. It was $56, which is pretty expensive for three springs. Of course, if you uh, reduce the weight of the two hammer springs here, you're going to be reducing the force with which the hammer hits the firing pin and then the primer. So uh, there's a possibility of uh, or increased possibility of light primer strikes if these springs are swapped out for lighter ones. Um, so what I'm going to do is first just replace the sear spring right back here and see how that affects the trigger weight and then replace the uh, two hammer springs so all the springs are replaced with the ones in this kit and see how that affects the trigger weight. I have replaced only the sear spring. These are the factory hammer springs. going to throw this back in see what the trigger weight is. Seven and a quarter. Seven. Seven. So replacing just a sear spring in the trigger pack dropped the trigger weight about a pound to a pound and a quarter. Now both reduced weight hammer springs and the reduced weight sear spring are installed. Go back in the gun. Let's check the weight. Six and a half. Six and a half. Six and a half. So if you replace all the springs with the upgraded spring kit, uh, it will drop the trigger weight about one and three quarter to two pounds if you do just the sear spring because you don't want to deal with the possibility of light primer strikes and you're going to drop it about a pound. But now this trigger feels really good. Um, this actually... I think exceeded my expectations of what the trigger in this could be. Now I am going to be running this rifle uh, suppressed. I have a dead air Sandman in an ATF jail currently. I'm sure I'll post some content once I get it of running it on my various rifles. But one thing I'm going to be doing is swapping out the uh, gas regulator for a factory one that is designed for suppressed firing. And so this is the factory one that comes with the rifle. And it has normal and adverse position than what is called GR. It's a, you know, probably grenade position, which just completely cuts the gas off. So here's a look inside the gas piston area. And we have a hole right here. That's the actual gas port from the barrel. And then there's some other holes around the circumference of this. But um, this is the one right here that bleeds excess gas off. In uh, normal firing position, gas comes in from the barrel at this hole and goes out through the bleed port at this hole. When turned to position two, adverse firing position, Gas comes in from the barrel on this hole, which is exactly the same size as this one. I checked it with calipers. And it bleeds out of this hole, which is um, smaller. So essentially, you're not letting any more gas into the gas piston area. You're just um, limiting how much gas bleeds off to get from normal to adverse firing positions. And then when you turn this all the way around to uh, GR or grenade position, this continuous face of the gas piston area is up against the gas port. No gas comes into the gas piston area whatsoever. This is the new gas plug I got from v1tactical.com. They're the only place I've ever seen that offers these. I had to uh, put my email in for a wait list. They got like 75 of them in and I got one of them. These two ports are your normal ports, and they're the same as the normal or position one ports on this gas regulator. You lose your adverse position ports, which on the old one are this guy and this guy. 
And I don't know why they didn't put them in this gas plug because they had room for them right there and right there. So that kind of sucks. But now you turn this all the way around to what is marked uh, GR or grenade position on the gas regulator housing. And you have this inlet port and this outlet port. Now, this inlet port is the same size as this inlet port for position one. So for suppressor position, all you're doing is bleeding off a ton of gas right here out of this port. So this gun will not be quiet <laughs> when you suppress it. But then again, any 5.56 five, that you throw a suppressor on, the bullet's still moving supersonic. It's not going to be hearing safe. You should absolutely wear hearing protection. So this is definitely going to be a bit louder um, in terms of signature reduction from the suppressor. Of course, you'll still have uh, less muzzle report and less flash, but you're still going to have a pretty loud report from this, uh, this large gas bleed-off port. Now, when I get my rifle suppressor, I'll make a follow-up video about suppressing the AUG. For like the $110 I paid for this little thing, kind of pissed that I didn't get a position two for adverse conditions, and kind of pissed that they're not restricting the gas coming into the piston area, they're just venting more of it off. So just to give you an idea of the orientation of this in the actual um, gas regulator body itself, so this is position one where this lines up with this you pull that down and rotate it that would be position two if i had the factory regulator in there and then to get to grenade or well now what is the suppressor setting you rotate it back this way and now you see this lines up with the gr setting The last thing I need to do to make this ready for a suppressor is, of course, a key mount muzzle device for the Dead Air Sandman suppressor. So this is a uh, Sons of Liberty Gunworks uh, Knox 5.56 muzzle device with the key mount on it, and this is their uh, nine-port neutral configuration muzzle device. I really like these. They're a uh, great middle ground between flash hiding and some compensation and muzzle brake effects while not being too obnoxious. I put this Corvus Defense um, case deflector on here. They have three versions of this. They have a right-hand standard stock, left-hand standard stock, and then this one for the NATO stock, and it's only right-handed because these stocks are only right-handed. It's not necessarily that I'm going to shoot this offhand a lot, although I might, but I have buddies who are left-handed who are probably going to want to shoot it, and as it is, the brass comes out at like 5, 5.30, so if you're shooting it left-handed and your face is right here, the brass is going right in your teeth. So this is going to uh, deflect the brass away from your face. So the whole time I've been upgrading this, uh, I purchase parts as I can find them and they're available. They've been trickling in and I put them on and take it to the range. I probably have three to 400 rounds through the gun right now. I'm finding that uh, an LPBO fits my use case uh, for this rifle really well. Uh, this is a range toy for me, and the range I go to only has 200 yards max that I can shoot, and most bays are 30 yards or less. The prism optic was okay in general, but inside 30 yards, the rifle really needed a 1x option. Um, the illumination on the prism scope wasn't bright enough to effectively use occluded shooting on the brightest days. Uh, so this is a primary arms SLX ACSS Nova 1 to 6. Um, it has like true red dot bright, daylight bright illumination, um, which really makes the 1X great. The image is flat enough and pretty close to 1X. Um, the glass is decent. I only paid 340 bucks for it. And I'm not really as concerned with durability on a range toy. Uh, I, think, I think this is my new favorite um, budget LPVO. Uh, I considered the Steyr fixed magnification optics, but they are pretty damn expensive and would require I buy another 1X optic along with them. And it would have done away with my preferred uh, front sling mounting point. So I really like these arrow lightweight scope mounts. And you can see that I'm running it backwards to get the scope where I needed it for correct eye relief. Uh, and also keep the QD sling point where I want it. I also think it looks way cooler than running it the correct direction. Because this makes it look kind of like 
the factory mount for the Steyr fixed magnification optics. It just fits the look of the gun way better. I got my favorite uh, uh, Blue Force Gear Vickers sling set up. Of course, throw a Ranger band on there as a sling keeper when not in use. So So I believe all defensive rifles at very least should have a sling optic and white light. Um, this is a range toy for me, so I'm not actually going to be running a white light on it, but I did want this video to kind of be a comprehensive guide to upgrading the Steyr AUG. So I did want to touch on white light mounting. So I think the easiest way to go about this is get a scout light and get either an air sock amount of some sort that puts it where you want it using this little piece of Picatinny rail or these Scout Light Pros actually have this adjustable pivot and they come with an M-Lock and a Picatinny mount. This actually puts it in a great location because I can just wrap my thumb back up around the grip and actuate it right there and still have my uh, finger on the trigger. So if you were left-handed, obviously your right hand would be up here and you'd want to run a pressure pad to this. Um, any Scout Light you put here, you could run a pressure pad to. If you wanted to put it in a different spot like more forward to mitigate uh, barrel or suppressor shadow you would want to have the extended rail that Corvus Defense sells or you would want to have the rail down here uh, that replaces the uh, vertical foregrip that then you could attach your other vertical foregrip onto and uh, mount your light low and way forward um, so there's quite a few ways to put a white light on this there's really only one option if you don't add something else to the gun or modify it or buy new parts for it, and that's this little Picatinny rail section right here. Well, that's it. That's all I got on my uh, Steyr AUG here. I hope this video was uh, interesting and informative. Uh, drop me a comment down below if you got any questions. I'll do my best to answer it, um, although I'm no expert on this platform. It's my first bullpup. It's the OG bullpup. It's my uh, favorite movie gun, and now it's mine. And the uh, upgrades that I've done to it have greatly increased its comfort and usability uh, for my purposes on the range. Um, and thank you for watching.